Good morning. For our call to worship this morning, I'd like to read from Psalms 103, verses 1 through 5. Psalms 103, verses 1 through 5. It says this, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. We would like to welcome you to the Albernet Christian Church this morning. Some announcements that we'd like to highlight. Um, no youth group this Wednesday. Um, I know it's in there, but that's incorrect. So no youth group on Wednesday. Um, the Thursday community Lent service will be at the Lafayette Salem Evangelical Church or for you older people, the Lafayette EUB Church. Um, that will be at 7 and Pastor John Moss will be speaking there. Um, there'll be more information. It, there's more information there at the back of the sanctuary if, if you're interested. Um, I did the newsletter this week. He kind of proofread it and printed off 513 copies, folded them, sent them off, took one down to the bus garage and set it on the driver's table. And uh, somebody opened it up and found spelling mistakes like in the first 10 seconds. Um, that's just the way it goes. So it's, it's, it's John Moss, not John Moss. Sorry about that, John. Um, are there any other announcements that we need to make at this time? We still have several people that are on our prayer list. Um, do we have any additions or updates or corrections to those people? If not, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day that you have given to us the gift of another 24 hours from you. We're grateful, Lord, for the privilege and the opportunity to be able to meet and to worship in your house this morning. And Heavenly Father, we just claim the promise that wherever two or three are gathered together in your name, that you are there. And so we ask that you'd meet us and that you'd change us and that you would make us more like you this morning. Lord, we pray for those who are on our prayer list. We have so many that need your very real and very special touch. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you would just uh, be with each and every one of them and that you would meet them at their need. We pray that you would just be with um, Ed and Jana as they uh, come back this week from Florida, that you provide them safety as they journey and just watch over them each and every mile of the way. For those, Lord, that we have not mentioned but are on our hearts this morning, we just ask that you'd move in a mighty way and bring victory to your people. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> our first hymn this morning is hymn number 68. Let's stand. We'll sing first, second, and fourth verse. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Hymn number 68. <clears throat> All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Oh, that with yonder sacred throng at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. You may be seated. 
Our next hymn is hymn number 316, A Shelter in the Time of Storm. Let's sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Hymn number 316. Rock in him we hide, a shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever he'll be tied, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land. A shelter in the time of storm. A shade by day, defense by night. A shelter in the time of storm. No fears alarm, no foes affright. A shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land. A weary land. A weary land, oh Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh rock divine, oh refuge dear, a shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper ever near, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. And then if you'll turn over to hymn number 299, we'll sing the first, second, and fourth verse of Amazing Grace. 299. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. <coughs> but now. Was grace that taught hard to fear. My fears read <coughs> that grace appeared. Our I first. Publicans and Sinners While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with them and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Mark, 2nd chapter, 15th and 16th verse. He eats with publicans and sinners. To the Pharisees, it was an accusation to think that one who claimed to be the Holy One of God would eat, would share this sacred moment of human communion with the unholiest horde of humanity. Gentile, and green-tainted tax collectors 
promiscuous prostitutes, the unclean, the people of the earth under their fingernails. It was always, it has always been true, he eats with publicans and sinners. But it was never truer than at the Last Supper. There was Judas, his white knuckled money bag clutched close to his chest, 30 pounds of silver, pieces of silver, fuller. There was Peter, good to the old, get thee behind me, I never knew him. Put your sword away, Peter. There were James and John, hot-tempered as the summer suns of thunderstorm, calling down lightning, clamoring for the first shall be the last best seats. There was Matthew, a dishonest-to-goodness publican, taxing the impatience of his patriotic patriotic compadres. There were uh, there was Simon the militant that take matters into his own bloody hands revolutionary. They were all there, all the disciples, sinners if not publicans, and he ate with them. It reminds us that if we ever come to this table without recognize, recognizing that we are sinners, we are making a grave mistake. For if we say that we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 1 John 1.8 But it also reminds us that if we ever fail to come to this table because we do not recognize ourselves as sinners, we are making a grave mistake. For if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we celebrate the fact that he still eats even with us. Let us be turning to the communion hymn on page 247, singing the first, second, and standing on the fourth verse.
Heavenly Father, as we approach this table this morning, we're so thankful, thankful for a place to come and, and gather with our family, and also thankful for the sacrifice of your only Son on the cross to wipe free our sins. As we partake of this meal, we're reminded of that suffering through these emblems, the cup representing the blood that flowed freely, and the loaf, the body that was broken, I ask that you bless each one who is here today, and let us go out into the world and spread the news to all who listen. It's in your Son's most precious and holy name I pray these things. Amen. Amen.
God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Heavenly Father, as we come to this part of our service, we pause to reflect on the many blessings that you have bestowed on each and every one of us. Lord, you've been so very good to us in so many, many different ways. And as we reflect on those blessings, we give back a portion of that that you have so freely given. As we do so, we ask for your continued blessing on both the gift and the giver. And that, Heavenly Father, you would help us to use those gifts to reach out to our community and to our world with the love of Jesus to all who will listen. <clears throat> I ask now that you be at the remainder of our service. I ask that you be with me as I bring the message that, Heavenly Father, you would help us to understand it and help us to apply it. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you. We've started a series on the hard sayings of Jesus. And as we uh, discussed last week, there are some things that Jesus said that are hard to understand. And there are other things that are not hard to understand. They're just hard to do. Um, Jesus talked about um, if your right hand causes... Uh, you know, causes you to sin to cut it off and to cast it away from you, or if your right eye causes you to sin to pluck it out and to cast it away from you, for it is better to go into eternity um, maimed than it is to not go there at all. And I don't think that Jesus there is saying that you should cut your hand off or that you should poke your eye out. But um, there are other things that Jesus talked about that were difficult to understand. He said, if, uh, if you want to uh, be saved, you must be born again. And Nicodemus asked and said, can I enter my mother's womb and be born a second time? Uh, some things that Jesus said are difficult to understand. And some things are just not difficult to understand, but hard to do. And so this morning, we're going to look at one of those, again, that's kind of in that second category. So if you turn with me to the book of Luke, chapter uh, 14, verses 25 through 33, it says this, large crowds large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. That's a hard saying. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose once one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, This fellow, fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? Or if he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. We're going to show a quick video here.
uh, Talmud is the ancient word for uh, a disciple, uh, but that means a disciple is a learner, a student. And uh, yes, Jesus did not just start a new thing when he called disciples. It was a very uh, rabbinic thing to do. In fact, any rabbi worth his salt had disciples. Uh, so it, in that sense, the gospel is not like a brand new radical thing when, when Yeshua says, come and follow me. Uh, but of course, as always, I believe, Yeshua just gives a, a deeper meaning to that, a slightly different angle to that. Uh, so when he calls uh, some of his Talmudim, uh, plural Talmudim, uh, it's to come and learn, follow me. Uh, the English word disciple, of course, comes from discipline. So I think that's definitely part of it too. It's, it's, a, it's a discipline to follow this certain rabbi. And some may follow Rabbi Hillel, some may follow Rabbi uh, Shammai of the first century, but. In that sense, it's Rabbi Yeshua saying, follow me, I have a certain path, a certain things, uh, a learning for you, and a discipline, a walk for you to follow. I think Yeshua has always called his people to this Jewish idea of discipleship, which is to be a learner, to uh, follow the model of your rabbi, and to be a disciplined one in walking with your rabbi. So, um, uh, to leave for three years, three and a half years, and live with their rabbi, Yeshua, what an incredible learning experience that was. But again, I think we, we've inherited more of the Western, kind of Greek approach to learning, and often we've applied that to Yeshua and, and the Bible. And so, when we use the term discipleship, it's kind of like we lock into that I find that teaching mode and to say, well, here's, come to our discipleship class, here's 10 lessons, learn these verses, now you're a disciple. Uh, whereas uh, Yeshua clearly calls us to uh, a lifestyle and uh, a lifestyle of making him Lord. So it's not just a body of knowledge that we've mastered, but it's really a, a submission uh, of our will to to him as lord i know that they're trying to just not make it look like a talking head on the screen there but it made me a little seasick there <laughs> all that in and out um, in present times we've come to understand a disciple to be someone who learns about his or her teacher or leader. While clearly this is part of being a disciple, there is much more to being a disciple than that. Ray Vandalon says this about discipleship. The decision to follow a rabbi as a Talmud or disciple meant total commitment in the first century as it does today. Since a Talmud was totally devoted to becoming like the rabbi, he would have spent his entire time listening and observing the teacher to know how to understand the scripture and how to put it into practice. Jesus describes this, his relationship to his disciples in exactly this way. He chose them to be with him so that they could be like him. Most students sought out the rabbis that they wished to follow. And this happened to Jesus on occasion as well. A student, If a student wanted to study with a rabbi, he would ask if he might follow the rabbi. The rabbi would consider the student's potential to become like him and whether he would make the commitment necessary. It is likely most students were turned away. Some, of course, were invited to follow me. This indicated the rabbi believed the potential Talmud, or disciple, had the ability and the commitment to become like him. It would be a remarkable affirmation of the confidence the teacher had in the student. That quote comes from That the World May Know Ministries, of course by Ray Vandalon. 
Today, I want to share with you one of the saddest stories recorded in the New Testament. It's a story about a young man who is invited to become one of Jesus' disciples, or Taladim, but refused when asked when he felt that the price for discipleship was too high. Turn with me, if you will, to Mark 10, 17 through 22. Reading from the New Century Version, it says this, As Jesus started to leave, a man ran to him and fell on his knees before Jesus. The man asked, Good teacher, what must I do to have life forever? Jesus answered, Why do you call me good? <clears throat> Only God is good. You know the commands. You must not murder anyone. You must not be guilty of adultery. You must not steal. You must not tell lies about your neighbor. You must not cheat. Honor your father and mother. What was Jesus referring to here as he's saying those things? The Ten Commandments, isn't he? Right? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the man said, Teacher, I have obeyed all these things since I was a boy. Jesus looked at the man, loved him, and said, There is one more thing that you need to do. Go and sell everything that you have. Give the money to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come... And follow me. The man was very sad to hear Jesus say this, and he left sorrowfully because he was rich. Jesus had an ability that we don't have. He was able to look into the heart of this young man, and he saw what was most important to him. Had it been somebody else, Jesus could have just as easily said, I need you to leave your family. Or, I need you to leave your home. For this particular young man, that which he cherished the most was his wealth. And Jesus was saying to him, I have to come first. Set that aside, and then come follow me. It's a sad story, because it represents a journey never taken. This young man was excited. The Bible says that he ran to Jesus, and he fell to his knees to ask his question. Yet when the conversation was over, he left in great sorrow, because he was unwilling to accept the cost of following Jesus. It's sad, because Jesus offered to this young man the same opportunity that he offered to Peter, James, and John, and the other disciples. But because of his earthly riches, this young man threw that opportunity away. Stop and think about that for just a minute. For a few possessions, he threw away the chance to spend three and a half years to live with him and be a part of the most pivotal thing in all of human history. To see God face to face and learn from him that which was most important. Being a Talmud or a disciple requires complete and unwavering commitment to follow his rabbi. Jesus put it this way in Mark 8, 34 through 37, reading from the New Living Translation. If any of you wants to be my follower, he told them, you must put aside your selfish ambition Shoulder your cross and follow me. If you try to keep your life for yourself, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, and for the sake of the good news, you will find true life. And how do you benefit if you gain the entire world, 
but lose your own soul in the process. Is anything worth more than your soul? Have you ever thought that you are doing the right thing or perhaps going to the right place and you find out that you are completely and utterly wrong? Maybe I'm the only one. Um, when I was a lot younger with the youth group, we used to do this game. It was called, uh, I can't even think of it. But in this game, there was, there was uh, these instructions that you gave to the kids, okay? And you told them, uh, the game was a success story, and so you gave them this sheet, and it had five different learning centers on it. There's like a, a learning center and a loving center and uh, all these different activities. So a laughing center, and uh, you would go to these, and there, each one of those things had five things that was on it. And you, t you would work to get these guys all worked up and, and try to, you know, get through this list as fast as they could. They would have to run from one center to the next center to the next center. And then, but also, you had these people, they were, they were good prophets and they were false prophets. And um, the false prophets were trying to get them to pursue their success story and to complete this chart and, and be the winner, right? And these other people were telling them to trade their success story in for a death certificate. And so it's just kind of like the good angel and the bad angel. You know, they come up on this person and they're like, you've got to do this, you can do this, right? And the other person is saying, no, throw that all away and take my death certificate and you would get these guys as worked up as you could and then at the very end you called them all together and you read the story of Jesus judgment where he separates the sheep from the goats and the whole point was to sacrifice your pursuit to gain everything for Jesus, for your death certificate. To your, you die to yourself so that you can have Jesus. And here's all these people that have thought that they were doing the right thing only to find that at the very end they pursued the exact opposite of what they should have been. And doesn't that mirror so much of life? We have people that go through life because they're convinced that what's really, truly important is having the right job or the right bank account or the right house or being around the right, knowing the right people. But when they get to the end of their life, the only thing that will matter is whether you've accepted the right person, Jesus. To be a Talmud or a disciple means that we must die to, to ourselves so that we can live for him. This morning, I'd like to look at three questions as we seek to define what discipleship really is. The first is this, what is discipleship? What is dis discipleship? If what uh, Rabbi Barney Kazdan and the, the World May Know Ministries is correct, it is much more than learning about who Jesus is and what he desires of us. Discipleship is the ability to recognize and follow the master's leading. Have you ever noticed how a mother can pick out the cry of her child even when surrounded by the cries and the noise of everyone else? The disciple is to be like that with his rabbi or his master as well. Jesus said it this way in John 10, 7, 27. My sheep recognize my voice. I know them and they follow me. In order to do that, we have to both know the master, which includes studying God's word and recognize his voice through the leading of the Holy Spirit. But discipleship is more even than that. It is like the reflection in the mirror. 
Our goal is to become so like the master that when we look in the mirror, we see him instead of ourselves. A true disciple is someone who seeks to become like the rabbi in every aspect of his life. Romans 9.26 puts it this way. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would become the firstborn with many brothers and sisters. The New American Standard Version says that God planned for us to become conformed to the image of his son. In other words, to become like him. You see, God's plan for his people goes beyond just knowing about Jesus. He wants us to be like Jesus in every way. To become a reflection of the master. We need to reflect Jesus in our attitudes, the way that we think, the way that we act, and the way that we relate to others. That the world may know ministries continues to say this. Being like the rabbi is the major focus of a disciple's life. They listen and question. They respond when questioned. They followed without knowing where the rabbi is taking them. Knowing that the rabbi has good reason for bringing them to the right place for his teaching to make the most sense. This means that the present day disciple must be no less focused on the rabbi, on Jesus. We must be with him in, this, uh, in his word. We must follow him even when we're not sure what the final destination is going to be. We must live by his teaching, which means that we must know those teachings well. And we must imitate him whenever we can. In other words... Everything becomes secondary in life to being like Jesus. The goal of the disciple is to resemble or to become so like the master that we are able to say, like the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow my example even as I follow the example of Jesus Christ. The second thing, that we can see are the benefits of becoming a disciple. What are the benefits of becoming a disciple? I believe that there are many. First, we'll have a heart like his. In uh, Luke 7, 12 through 14, it says, And as he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother. She was a widow, And a large crowd from the town was with her. When Jesus saw her, his heart went out to her. And he said, don't cry. Then he went up and touched the coffin. And those carrying it stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus did what? He gave him back. To his mother. Jesus saw this funeral procession and he saw this mother who is weeping, who is in anguish because she's lost her son. And the Bible says his heart went out to her. He hurt for her. And so he did what no one else could do. He gave her son back to her. Talk about being in the right place at the right time. As I become more like him, I will have a heart like his. I will begin to feel the way he feels. He was a man of great compassion. He was a champion of the helpless and a defender of the downtrodden. So much so that on more than one occasion, Jesus was accused of being a friend of sinners. Jesus' response was, it's not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. As I learn from the rabbi and become more like him, the things that are important to him will become the things that are important to me as well. A second result 
is that I will see as he sees. In Matthew 9, 36, it says, When he saw the crowds, Jesus felt sorry for them because they were hurting and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. As I become more like Jesus, I will see like he sees. Jesus looked out, not on, he didn't look at outward appearances, but on what was on the inside. Too many times we see people who are overweight or bald or have bad eyes or dress poorly and we judge them by what we see. Jesus looked on the inside to determine a man's true worth. And as we become more like Jesus, and as we conform to his image, we'll begin to see the way that Jesus does. A third result of discipleship with him is that I can look to the future with hope and expectation. 1 Peter 3, 11 through 13 says this, You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. In our Sunday school class, we just came through Revelation and we just talked about the new heaven and the new earth there, right? It's not new as in a brand new one. It's new as in a perfectly restored heaven and earth. That God is going to fix all of the mess that we have made of this earth and of this creation and it's going to be just like it was before the fall when God first presented it to Adam and Eve and that is something to look forward to as I become more like Jesus I can look forward to the future with hope and expectation I've read the book and in the back we find that we win. As the image in the mirror becomes more like Jesus, I can know that I get to spend the rest of eternity with him in heaven. Fourthly, a fourth result, is that I can experience real peace and trust. John 14, 27 says, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give isn't like the peace the world gives. So don't be troubled and afraid. If you turn on the news, it's very easy to have your peace stolen from you, isn't it? We've got China that's unhappy, saber-rattling. We've got Russia that is saber, not just saber-rattling. They're moving tanks and rockets into Ukraine. We've got Iran, they were saying on the news, that has uranium that's 85% enriched. And when they hit 90, they can create an atomic bomb. We've got North Korea with rockets. It seems like there's no peace in our world around us. But if we put our hope and our faith in Jesus, we know that no matter what happens in this world, we're going to end up in a better place. As I become more like Jesus, I can look forward to the future with hope and expectation. Sorry, as I become more like Jesus, I can experience real peace and trust. Just as a, as a disciple in Bible times trusted the rabbi and master, so I can trust Jesus knowing that even in all the chaos that is around me, that Jesus is still in control. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians that Jesus must reign until his, all of his enemies have been defeated. And the last enemy to be defeated is death. Do people still die today? Yes, they do. Then that means that Christ is still reigning. He's still in control. Fifth, a fifth result is that I can draw others to Jesus. I can draw others to Jesus. Finally, as I become more like Jesus... I can draw others to him. In John 12, 32, it says, If I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people toward me. 
if we are reflecting Jesus in the mirror of our life, and people are seeing Christ through us, Jesus will draw all people to himself. Jesus instructed us to let our light shine so that when men see our good works, they do what? Say, good job, buddy. No. So that when they see our good works, that their attention is pointed to our master, to Jesus. All of these are benefits that I can expect as the image in the mirror becomes more like him. As I become more like Jesus as his disciple. Finally, <clears throat> what are some obstacles to being a disciple? Well, um, what is it that gets in the way of us becoming a faithful Talmud or disciple? Well, first, we place ourselves or our possessions first, just like the rich young ruler. Jesus, looking at the man, loved him. Do you notice that? It wasn't just that Jesus wanted to punish him or, or you know, somehow make things uncomfortable for him. The scripture says there that Jesus looked at him and loved him and said, there's one more thing that you need to do. Go sell everything that you have and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But he was very sad to hear Jesus say this. And he left sorrowfully because his wealth got in the way. We saw this one obstacle earlier in the message with the rich young ruler. The Bible says that he went away very sad because he could not give up his wealth to follow Jesus. One of the obstacles that prevent us from being Jesus' disciple and reflecting him in the mirror of our lives is our inability to give up our possessions or the things that are standing between us and Jesus. Someone far wiser than me has coined this statement. He is no fool who gives up that which he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. I thought that was profound. He is no fool who gives up that which he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. We came into this world with nothing, and when we leave, we'll leave the exact same way that we came. We will not take anything with us. So what should be really most important? Well, it should be the person that we're going to serve for all of eternity. Everything that surrounds you is temporary. The Bible says that this whole world will one day be consumed by fire. Since this is true, what possessions do you have that are worth standing between you and your Savior? Second, a second obstacle is that we want to learn about him, but not necessarily be like him. We want to know about him, but not necessarily reflect him. Matthew 15, 8 through 9 says this, These people show, me honor, show honor to me with their words, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is worthless. The things they teach are nothing but human rules. This is actually a quote from the Old Testament. When Jesus is saying this in Matthew, he's actually quoting Isaiah 29, verse 13. A second obstacle of being with Jesus is that we want to learn about him but not become like him. And then thirdly, we just don't really want to make Jesus Lord. Luke 6.46 says, So why do you call me Lord when you won't obey me? When we accept Jesus, we accept him as both Savior and Lord of our life. We're okay with the Savior part. We understand we need to be saved Making Jesus Lord is much harder because that involves making Jesus the boss of me. He gets to tell me what to do. He gets to tell me what to believe. He gets to tell me what to say. He gets to tell me what to do. And that's much less pleasant. 
Today, Jesus calls you to be his disciple, his taladim. We must know God's word and Jesus' interpretation of it. We must be passionate in our devotion to that word and Jesus' example. As we are filled with the Spirit, we must be obsessed with being like Him as far as is humanly possible so that His image is reflected in the mirror of our life. We must strive for relationships with others so that, we will observe, so that when they observe us and seek to imitate our love, our devotion to God, and our Jesus-like lifestyle. Today, you've come to a crossroad. Because you've been confronted with God's word, it is impossible for you to leave as you came this morning. The decision is before you, and you must choose. Will you embrace the invitation to follow Jesus and be filled with joy and excitement as you contemplate the journey? Or will you leave as a rich young ruler with great sorrow because the cost is too great? What is standing in your way between you and Jesus? Is it your possessions, like the rich young ruler? Is it your family or your friends? Is it your own selfish ambitions and desires? Remember, Jesus says, What good is it to gain the whole world and yet forfeit your soul? Will you allow someone or something to cause you to throw away the greatest opportunity of your life, as the rich young ruler did. We talk about our goal, being able to go to heaven. But what makes heaven, heaven? Is it the gates of pearl, the walls of jasper, or the streets of gold? No. Heaven is where God is at. In the back of your minds, we can't can't wait to get to heaven so that we can meet God or Jesus. But God's plan isn't for you to begin your relationship with him when you draw your last breath and go to heaven. God's plan is for you to begin your relationship with him now. Maybe that's why we don't long for heaven the way that we should. Because we're going to meet a stranger instead of a dear friend. Jesus is calling you to be his Talmud or disciple. So that when people see you, they see Christ reflected in you. That you become the mirror in which people see Jesus. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. But that will only happen if people can see Jesus in the mirror of your life. Jesus is calling you to be his, his Talmud, his disciple. He knows that you can do it. He believes that you can be like him. He's calling you, just like he called Peter, James, and John. Come, follow me. If you're ready to step out and follow the master completely, then this is your opportunity as we sing our invitation hymn this morning. Let's turn to our invitation hymn. Hymn number... 468 and let's stand as we sing the first and final verse 468 anywhere with Jesus I can safely go anywhere he leads me in this world below anywhere without him dearest joys would fade Anywhere with Jesus I am not afraid Anywhere, anywhere Fear I cannot know Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go Anywhere with Jesus over land and sea Telling souls in darkness of salvation free. Ready as he summons me to go or stay. Anywhere with Jesus as he points the way. Anywhere, anywhere. Fear I cannot know. 
anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day that you've given to us. We thank you that you sent Jesus into this world to show us how to live and ultimately to die on the cross to pay the price for our sins. Help us, Lord, to be good and faithful disciples of Jesus so that you will one day be able to say of us, well done, good and faithful servant, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Be with us as we leave this place. Help us to reflect Jesus in our lives in every moment. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Blessed Redeemer, live.